All right, so before we get to the uh, responses for the Madagascar Island of Marvels show, I want to show you what this elephant bird actually looked like. So at the very end of, of the show, I mentioned there is this huge bird called the elephant bird that lived on the beaches of the southern end of Madagascar and about this, when humans started to show up, it started to disappear. So where did I go? Where's that image I had? That's not it. Let's see. There it is. Okay. So I don't know if I can make that any bigger. Um, what the heck? I had some images here. I guess I got to get them from a different source. Well, perhaps you guys can just see about how big these things were. So on the right is a modern day ostrich. On the left is the elephant bird, huge bird. Def, um, both are descendants of dinosaurs that survived the extinction from 65 million years ago. And their eggs are enormous. If I, uh, I can find one of those for you, elephant bird egg size. I mean, right now, the ostrich egg is the largest egg on earth. Well, <laughs> that white egg right there, that's an ostrich egg. This is the elephant bird egg. Massive. Just massive. I don't know what that little thing is. Maybe like a lizard egg. And then over here, you can see a chicken egg compared to an elephant bird egg. So, and this isn't like something that existed 50 million years ago. This was 1,000, 100 zero years ago. That's not that long ago. And it was all over Madagascar, at least the southern end of it. But then as humans started to show up, uh, this thing started to be wiped out. And I think it would be pretty cool to go to Madagascar and actually see these eggshells because I know on my bucket list, I've been to the Galapagos, I want to go to Madagascar and go down to that southern beach and see the eggshell fragments you know, of this massive bird that actually was there. And now it's, it's gone. All that's left are its bones and its uh, eggshells. All right, so let's go over these adaptations, shall we? There were several species of lemurs. And when I say there were several species, could those species interbreed and produce viable offspring? That's good. You're my most unanimous class so far uh, to say that. The definition of being a species means that you cannot reproduce with other members of a different species. So they could not produce viable offspring. Yes, Ayla. My golden retriever and Jet's make believe chihuahua are the same species. There's just different uh, subspecies, which are which are what we call breeds. Okay, let's go. So for all the lemurs, here's what I'm going to tell you. They basically all have the same adaptations. They are primates, just like us, just like monkeys. There's there's lemurs, tarsiers, monkeys, apes. And we are part of the apes. There's only five big apes. Uh, but lemurs are their own little branch of, of primates. They are lemurs, and there's more than 80 different species. They have opposable thumbs, just like us. They have binocular vision, two eyes in the front of their head, which makes one single image, just like us. They're highly social and highly intelligent, just like most of us. Well, um, also, they, they live in the trees. Most of them, they live in the trees or some sort of uh, plant life. So they need their hands and their thumbs and their feet for grasping because of the environment in which they live, for climbing, for swinging, for playing around. But they just have an overall life in the trees. So whether it's the injury or the um, safaka or all the different lemurs I mentioned, you could say their specialization is, uh, you know, they have a lot of dexterity in their hands. They have opposable thumbs. Uh, to live in the trees and the selective pressure would be their environment. Now, let's go to the Tenrec, which is the Madagascar version of a hedgehog. There were a couple adaptations that they mentioned and one that you guys didn't get to see because it's on a different episode. But for the two that you did see, this one specialization is that they produce more offspring than any other mammal on earth. Now, the benefit with that is, is that they can produce a lot of offspring so that you have a greater chance of some of those offspring reaching adulthood. I don't know if you know this, but when a mother sea turtle lays her eggs on the beach, she might lay a couple dozen eggs. You know how many actually make it to adulthood? One, two, three, if you're lucky. Because there's a lot of threats to baby turtles between the time they're born and the time they're adults. There's just by getting from their nest to the, to the water, uh, there's crabs, there's raccoons, there's seagulls. 
uh, turtles can crawl the wrong way. A law in Florida is that they, if you live on the beach, you have to turn your lights down by like 9 p.m. or something because the turtle could confuse the moonlight uh, and the beach lights, like from condos and houses. They go towards the water. And so houses have to turn down their lights so the turtles don't get confused. And that has definitely happened. There's been turtles that will crawl towards the condos and they get stuck in the bushes and everything. And also when you get, as we get into spring break and summer, if you go to the beach and you're digging holes in the ground to bury your friends or whatever, fill those holes in because there are sea turtle nests everywhere along Florida's coast. And if you have this big hole in the beach, just from playing around, the sea turtle babies could crawl in that hole and they can't get out. So you definitely need to seal those up. Well, anyway, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of luck for a baby sea turtle to make it to adulthood. Well, it takes a lot of luck for these little baby tenrecs to get to adulthood. So if there's a lot of babies, odds are you're going to have a few of them make it up to adulthood. Uh, so that specialization for that trait could be um, many young. The function is to you know, try to defy the odds, I guess you could say. And the selective pressures could be predators. It could be availability of food. If there's too many mouths to feed or if there's not enough food, uh, you really need to enhance your odds. And the other trait that they mentioned is that the babies are striped. So they can kind of camouflage on the bottom of the forest. So that would suggest that there are predators out there that like to eat little tin wrecks. Okay, the next is, is the giraffe weevil. This one should have been pretty simple. The males have a really long neck. Risa, what are those long necks used for? Um, fighting. fighting. What are they fighting over? Uh, for mates. For mates. So what type of selective pressure would that be? Competition. Competition for a mate which you could also say is sexual selection. Remember, competition is the number one driver of natural selection. Competition is survive. Well, what do you need to survive? You need food, you need water, you need a mate. You need to escape from predators. Or if you're a predator, you need to find the prey. It's always competition. Okay, the panther chameleon, this one had a lot. It had uh, fused toes, so they act like tongs. So it can act like it's tightrope walking a branch. Most lizards have arms on their side. Chameleons have them underneath, so they can tightrope those skinny branches. Uh, they even have prehensile tails to hold on to the branches. They have a long tongue to maybe get a, a little insect item that is on a branch they can't reach. And the males even have these horns to fight each other for a territory or maybe for a mate. So there's a lot of ways you could have gone. Uh, the functions of the toes and the legs and the tail are meant to have a life in the trees. The, the tongue is meant to get food you can't reach. And the horn is meant to fight off intruders, fight off rivals. The selective pressures could be your habitat, uh, competition for sure, competition for food, competition for space. Next is the pygmy chameleon, the smallest reptile on earth. It's like the size of an ant. Its specialization or annotation could be its size. When you're that small, you're hard to find. Predators aren't going to be a huge concern. And you are low maintenance. It's been, it's a clear fact that in the history of Earth, there have been five mass extinctions. And when there's a mass extinction, it's typically because there was a lack of resources, mainly food. Most animals over 40 pounds were wiped out in all these extinctions. Well, I, I would be surprised if one of these pygmy chameleons weighs 40 grams, which is nothing. Um, they don't need a lot of food. So if there is, for some reason, a major scarcity of food or water, these chameleons will still be fine because they maybe a few breadcrumbs and they're full. So they don't need a lot. Selective pressure, again, is the environment, availability of food. Uh, predators, it's hard to be eaten when you're so small. Can you imagine the camera crew trying to find a bunch of pygmy chameleons on the bottom of the forest? I'm sure it took them forever. All right, we're going to skip the lemurs. We already figured that out. The fossa. Okay. The fossa is the biggest predator on Madagascar. And a term I haven't taught you all yet is called the ecological niche. N-I-C-H-E. Niche. A niche is an organism's purpose. It is its job. It is what it does. Well, in most environments and ecosystems, there's the top predator. You call it the apex predator. The lion, the bear, the eagle, the shark, the crocodile. Well, Madagascar doesn't have any of those. So there's an open niche, which means it's like having an open job. There's a job vacancy. We need it to be filled. This type of species filled that role. 
it filled the role of the top predator because there were no top predators. So a specialization adaptation would be to be even better than his prey. You know, they said that they eat lemurs, so they have to be able to climb in the trees. They have to be able to climb in the trees better than the lemurs. That's the thing about being a predator. You have to be better than your prey if you're going to catch your prey. Uh, the function is to be able to pursue their prey item. This is a predator-prey dynamic. That would be the selective pressure. Prey needs to be able to evade and hide from predators. And predators need to be able to catch and pursue prey. Nothing wants to be eaten. You're going to have to be good enough to catch it. The boabab. This one should have been easy. It's a big fat tree. Why is it a big fat tree with a big fat trunk? Because it retains water. Why does it need to retain water? What's the selective pressure? The environment. Very, 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 very dry climate. All right, the sunbird uh, it has a beak that can pierce the bottom of a flower to steal the nectar. The selective pressure can just be availability of food, you know, resources, competition for food. We're going to skip the lemur again, go to the paradise flycatcher. You saw the males were pretty uh, pretty. The, they would, the one male that you saw was fighting off a rival male that got too close to the nest. That, so that would be competition for space and for a mate. Um, the selective pressures can be, again, competition. But also, when that drongo came in and tore apart the nest, I guess it just wasn't aggressive enough. So that's kind of natural selection selecting against that bird's lack of uh, aggressive aggression and aggressiveness. If you've lived around here in Florida for a while, you know that mockingbirds are the state bird of Florida and they will chase down birds that are five times their size. Every time I'll see a mockingbird, which I could fit in my hand, chasing a big black crow or an osprey or an owl because those birds got too close to the nest. Mockingbirds don't care. They're like honey badger. He don't care. He don't give up. They're, they'll just tear you up. Mockingbird is like the honey badger of birds. Well, the paradise flycatcher just wasn't aggressive enough and the drongo tore apart their nest. So the, the female said, screw this. I'm going to find someone who can actually stand up. Stand up for me, stand up for a nest. Okay, two more. The blind cave fish. Uh, specialization adaptation and with some weird ones. It's in a very deep, dark cave. What is the point of having pigment if no one can see you? No point in being colorful, so no more, no pigment. Waste of resources. Same thing with the eyes. What's the point of having eyes if you can't see anything anyway because it's pitch black? And also it can swim upside down. This was the most intriguing one. Uh, the function would be perhaps to find food. The narrator said maybe it's not really that well understood. Perhaps it's to help them find food better, which is competition for food. And then lastly, uh, the coolest one I think is the, the snail shell spider. Its ability, its adaptation is to find a snail shell, which you have to find it first, and be able to use the webbing to lift it off the ground and suspend it from a branch to get off that hot, hot, hot sand. The function again would be to, to make a home. And the selective pressure is the environment. That sand has gotta be burning hot during the day. Doesn't feel good. You guys have likely been on sand that's burning hot. So the spider gets off of it. All right, you guys can go submit that. And what I'm gonna ask you to do now is to, hold on, is to um, get out your Hardy Weinberg problems. Who's calling? Yeah. To, they ha, didn't it have that beak that was, sh that was shaped in a way to be able to pierce the flower? Oh, the, the flycatcher is, the, the males are very uh, pretty and colorful and they can sing to try to attract a mate. All right. It's halftime of the game, by the way. Plants up 44 to 36. Okay. So now that that is taken care of, Go back here. And what I would like you guys to do, and I'm going to pause the video here so people at home watching don't have to sit here for a long time, is on Canvas, I provided you guys with the FRQ, the questions that you answered on Wednesday, and the rubric. So I'm going to pass out the rubric, and I'm going to give you about four or five minutes to answer, or not answer, to grade your neighbor's 
FRQ. So I want you to trade with a neighbor. If you have three neighbors in the area, do a, a triangle trade, you know, three-way trade. And I'm going to pass out the rubric, and I want you to grade the rub or grade your FRQ based on the rubric. You guys are just the referee. No favoritism. Just be objective. Call it like you see it. I'm going to pause the recording here, and we'll get back when we're done. Okay, we're back. So what you guys are reading are from 2008. The AP Biology exam has evolved. Get it? Changed over time since 2008 and what is considered an acceptable answer back then really is not good enough now. So I'm going to share with you what I think would be a full score, at least on part A for this particular problem. So on part A, you all are, are on the prompt, you all are given the frequencies of P and Q. But you're not explicitly said, this is P, this is Q. You're given the dominant and the recessive alleles. You need to know that dominant is P, recessive is Q. For part A, you're being asked, what is the frequency of each genotype? Homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive. And what is the frequency of the dominant phenotype? So here's what I put. Take all this in. Here we go. According to the information provided, the frequency of the dominant allele, which is P, is 0.6. The frequency of the recessive allele, which is Q, is 0 0.4. So what I've done here is I basically restated the prompt, making that clear. And I want you to look at the first words I used, according to the information provided. On the AP exam, you'll have six FRQs. If any of them give you a graph or a figure to refer to, like a picture, you need to say, according to the blah, according to the graph, according to the figure, according to the information in the prompt use that to show, hey, I'm not just making these numbers up. This is where I got them. So you, if you can cite, C-I-T-E, if you can cite those or that information, do it. Then I go on to say, all right, here's what I'm going to do. To find the homozygous dominant frequency, which is P squared, take the value of P and square it. So I show my work. 0 0.6 squared equals 0 0.36 equals P squared. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard the expression, trying to find a, a needle in a haystack. Well, sometimes trying to find an answer like this is like trying to find a needle in a stack of needles. I have seen students with so much work, like so many numbers, I'm thinking, where's their answer? Where is it hiding? They, I don't know what's the work, I don't know what's the answer. What do they want me to see to grade them? So what you should do is box, underline, or circle your answers to show the grader, hey, this is what I want you to grade, 0.36 equals P squared. So I show my work on the left. In the middle right here, I show my answer. And then on the right, I say my answer is P squared. If you just put 0 0.36, that's not good enough. You have to say 0 0.36 equals P squared. Leave no stone unturned, don't get lazy. You need to show your work, show your answer, and show what your answer means. To find the homozygous recessive frequency, which is Q squared, take the value of Q and square it. 0 0.4 squared equals 0 0.16 equals Q squared. So on the left, 0 0.4 is Q. If you square it, you get 0 0.16. And then I say 0 0.16 equals Q squared. And then lastly, to find the heterozygous frequency, which is 2PQ, multiply uh, 0.6, which is P, and 0.4, which is Q, and then multiply the product by 2. The product is an answer to a multiplication problem. So 0 0.6 times 0 0.4 equals 0 0.24, times 2 equals 0.48, which equals 2PQ. So now I have, two, I have three out of four possible points. And then lastly, it wants me to find the frequency of the dominant phenotype. Well, if, if the dominant phenotype is homozygous dominant and heterozygous. I need to add those two. Individuals expressed in the dominant phenotype are either homozygous dominant P squared or heterozygous 2PQ. To calculate the frequency of the dominant phenotype, add the values of P squared and 2PQ. So I say P, I reiterate P squared is 0.36, 2PQ is 0.48. Uh, 0.36 plus 0.48 equals 0.84. If you just said 0.84, that's not good enough. You need to say 0.84 is the frequency of the dominant phenotype, okay? Now, that's just part A. There are four points available. For part B, 
how can the Hardy Weinberg principle of genetic equilibrium be used to determine the, uh, whether this population is evolving? Uh, well, you either can prove it is evolving or it isn't. If it is not evolving, then you're going to say that uh, the five conditions of Hardy Weinberg are in play. There's no gene flow, there's no genetic drift, there's no natural selection, there's no random mating in there, or sorry, there is random mating. And there's no, what I say, no natural selection, no mutation, no gene flow, no genetic drift. And that is if Hardy-Weinberg is in play, which means no evolution. If you're saying there is evolution, then you're going to say that those conditions are not in play, that there is gene flow, there is genetic drift, there is mutation. There's something that's causing the allelic frequencies to change. Change and evolution are interchanging words. Then finally, C, identify a particular environmental change and describe how it might alter allelic frequencies in this population. So you get a lot of freedom with this. Maybe you might say there was a forest fire. There's a forest fire that changed the environment and it wiped out the, a large sect of the population which altered the allelic frequency. Allelic frequency just means how many dominant alleles, how many recessive alleles. So you could have said a comet, you could have said climate change, you could have said deforestation, you could have said a lack of food, something changed the environment. And that's gonna cause the frequencies of the alleles to change with it. Now, you guys have your neighbor's um, answers and you now have them graded. I want you to hand it back to your neighbor. Keep it the rubric, keep everything else. And what I would like you to do now with the rest of the time in class, which is about 13 minutes, we're right on target, is I want you to rip off the rubric front page from the rest of the packet. Rip off the rubric. Rip it off. Put it on the side. And behind that, you have three student sample answers from 13 years ago. I want you to grade these just as you graded your neighbor. And if you look at, if you take a quick little peek on the very last page of your packet, there is what the actual college board graders gave them. So what I would like you to do is grade the first sample, sample uh, A, give it a score, and then look on the back page to see what the actual college board graders gave them. And to do the same for B and C, okay? In order for you guys to do well in this portion of the FRQ, you need to know how the belly of the beast operates, how College Board grades things. And that starts today. I'm going to stop the video now because we're practically done. If you have not graded these sample FRQs, please do so and see how your grading compares to the actual grades by College Board.